Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar today <clears throat> on fiduciary matters, how to be the best trustee for your organization's retirement plan. Um, my name is Daniel Rodriguez, and I am the CEO of CRI TPA Services. Um, and with me today, I have Joy Hodgson, my partner, and uh, we'll be talking about ways for you and you uh, as you are running your retirement plan, whether you're a business owner or in the accounting and finance department or maybe the HR office, um, how you can uh, best operate that plan, some, some responsibilities that you have, and <clears throat> hopefully uh, that you'll be able to take away some, some best practices that, can, that you can implement into your plan to make it run better, run smoother, uh, and do what's right for your responsibilities as well as what's right for the employees and participants in your organization. Um, for any advisors and CPAs on, on the line, the, this presentation is directed um, more towards what our plan sponsor, uh, business owners and, and those folks have to do with regards to the plan. <clears throat> but uh, for those of you consulting those folks, this is hopefully a, a wealth of information for you. Um, so our presentation today will take about an hour, uh, maybe a little bit under that, but it's about an hour. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to answer, ask those in the questions, and we'll try to get to those as best we can throughout the session. Um, so again, uh, we look, thank you again for taking time out of your day to, to join us on this, this webinar. Uh, again, Daniel Rodriguez, and I'm based in Tallahassee, Florida. And then again, my partner, which you should be able to see her uh, as well, uh, Joy Hodgson, and she is out in Lubbock, Texas. Um, together, we, we run CRI TPA Services, which is a portfolio company of Car Riggs and Ingram. And our focus is on retirement plan consulting and administration for primarily small business retirement plans. Uh, we've got clients, most of our clients are under 100 participants, but we've got several clients uh, over that, you know, in the couple of hundred participant range. Um, so we are uh, happy to have you with us today. So just real quick, a brief about me. Um, I graduated from Florida State University here in Tallahassee. I've, I've lived in Tallahassee now for, oh goodness, uh, 18 years um, and have been with, with the firm for about 13 years now. Uh, I enjoy my free time uh, watching baseball and, and see the Seattle Mariners and uh, as well as college football and, and college basketball. Um, any sports will, will do for me. Uh, then just some other, other things about me. I, it says I traveled outside of Florida last summer. Um, it was actually two years ago for the first time I left, uh, went further west than Florida uh, for the first time in my life. So um, traveled to Canada up in uh, Banff two years ago, and I'll get the opportunity to travel again west of Florida here in next week or in the next couple of weeks. I'll be going to Dallas and, and Arizona. And then lastly, we have uh, our family has a three year old dog named Pepper. And then because four kids and a dog isn't crazy enough, we added a, a puppy, a golden retriever named Ginger. So that's a little bit about me. And uh, now for my partner, Joy. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, a little bit about me. I graduated college from Abilene Christian University, which is a small private school in Abilene, Abilene, Texas, halfway between Dallas and New Mexico, for those of you who are from this part of the country. Um, many, many years ago, I, I was a basketball player in high school, uh, was part of a, a state basketball team uh, for the state of Texas and the 5A district. Um, I love traveling. I, I traveled quite a bit, but my favorite place to go was Germany. Um, I've been there once. I fell in love with it and ho hopefully sometime get to go back. And then in my spare time, <clears throat> I usually am cooking something. I love to cook and experiment. And so that's kind of my, my part-time hobby when I'm not doing pension plan uh, activities. So that's a little bit about me. Um, we're going to jump right into the agenda today. So we're going to cover three main topics. We're going to talk about who is a fiduciary in a retirement plan setting. How do you determine who that is? Um, 
how's that defined? Um, what, what does that look like? And then if you are a fiduciary, what is your role? What are you supposed to be doing as a fiduciary? Um, and then we'll offer up some best practices for fiduciaries to ensure you um, are meeting some of those criteria and um, working through tasks that a fiduciary is supposed to work through, especially as it relates to a retirement plan. And so once, once we get through these items, we certainly hope you'll have a better understanding of the, these uh, terms and the roles. Um, and if you are a fiduciary, um, have some tips to take back with you to um, ensure your compliance um, folder looks good as a fiduciary. So we hope uh, this, this is going to be a broad overview. Um, as some of you on the call may know, you could, you could drill down pages upon pages upon pages of legal things about fiduciary responsibilities. We're going to try to keep it big picture broad, broad in, in our coverage so that it applies to as many people on the call as possible. Um, and then try to dig down just a little bit. Um, so, so basically, a fiduciary would be anyone or any entity that has discretionary authority or control over the management of the assets that are held in the plan. So, the key piece there is discretionary authority or control. We'll talk about what that means um, in terms of how much discretion you have to have. But it's this first one is really about how the assets are managed, the investments, the money that's in the plan. Um, secondly, anyone or any organization who is rendering investment advice for a fee or any other compensation you're going to be a fiduciary with this plan. Um, and then anyone who has discretionary authority over the administration or operation of the plan. So once you set a plan up, you fund it, somebody within the organization or somebody you hire is going to be making day-to-day -day administrative operational decisions and doing those kinds of activities to run the plan. And so in some instances, um, you could be a fiduciary, not, you may not have any control over the assets, but you may have control over the operation of the plan. And that would deem you a fiduciary as well in some, some circumstances. All right, so key elements. How, what, what is it gonna look like if, if you're a, a, a fiduciary? If you have discretion over the plan, its assets, the investment, to us, that means you sign, approve, or you are authorizing anything related to the assets of the plan. That's a key component of determining if you have discretionary control. Um, alternatively, if you are someone who signed, let's say you sign documents, but you are simply following an established procedure or a policy or rules about the plan that were actually approved by other fiduciaries, then you may not be a fiduciary. You may just be following the administrative rules. And, and there's always a nuance there as to, am I, am I doing administrative things at somebody else's control or am I making the decision? So for example, I'm gonna give you an example. Um, if you sign a plan amendment that was already approved by your corporation's board, so the board approved the action, you simply were designated to sign an amendment to put it into effect. That doesn't necessarily make you a fiduciary, okay? Um, it's not, you're not making a discretionary decision. You're simply implementing someone else's decision. So that doesn't make you a fiduciary. If you sign documents, forms, agreements that actually change the plan amendments, I'm sorry, change the plan investments, um, you, something changes the fees being deducted from the participant accounts, or you modify any of the investment options. If you sign a document that does that, that 
could potentially make you a fiduciary. Um, but again, has that action already been approved by the board of the corporation and you're just implementing it? Any, anytime you change fees or investments, that's a pretty key element to, to fiduci being a fiduciary. Um, if you're someone who signs vendor agreements where people are being compensated out of plan assets, again, you could be a fiduciary in that aspect. Those are typical fiduciary things. If the, the signature sometimes is where the discretion is. It's kind of, it is a nuanced, um, it's a nuanced thing sometimes. All right, next screen, Dan. And this is where, what we just talked about is what we call, are you a functional fiduciary or a named fiduciary? So I'm gonna talk about a functional fiduciary. Someone, an individual at a corporation could potentially be a fiduciary. They could be considered a fiduciary based on what they do. Um, if you have any discretion over the plan assets, you could be a fiduciary. And oftentimes um, you could be a fiduciary even if you're not listed on any documents in any plan agreements, your name's nowhere listed as a trustee or designated fiduciary. But if you're doing those functions, Potentially, you could be a, a, a functional fiduciary. In other words, you have the power to, to do all the things a fiduciary can do. You just aren't listed. And so that's where you kind of have to watch. Um, if you're in charge of your plan's um, operation, in charge of your company, um, you're the owner, you're the shareholder, um, you're the partner. That's where these areas get a little bit of gray. But generally, we say, are you doing administrative tasks? Or are you doing fiduciary tasks? So, for example, are you authorizing an employer contribution to the plan? That's generally an employer fiduciary task. Are you approving loans or distributions? Um, are you authorizing the service providers to change their fees, increase them or decrease them, but a change in the fees? Um, if you're someone who's just updating the participant records online, that's, that's not a discretionary task. That's an administrative task. And so these are the concepts we try to look at in terms of identifying who's a fiduciary and who's in an administrator role. Okay. So in general, when you have a retirement plan, there are four, what I consider four primary fidu designated fiduciaries in, in the documents, in the plan's written documents. You are either the employer, the sponsor of the plan, which that it generally refers to the owners, the partners or shareholders. And, and I'll talk about nonprofits and other entity types, but for now, let, let's say you're the, you represent the employer. You've established the plan, you are responsible for selecting the providers, for signing on any co-fiduciaries. But if you are the employer or its designated representative, you are a fiduciary to the plan. You cannot sign away or delegate away your fiduciary responsibility. Even if you hire every service provider to do every other aspect for you, because you're the one hiring or firing service providers, that makes you a fiduciary. So the employer of the plan can, can really never get out of its responsibility as a fiduciary. The second tier of a fiduciary is, are you the plan administrator? So in most plans, qualified plans, defined benefit or uh, defined contribution plans, in the documents, there is a role called the plan administrator that's different than the employer, but it says who is going to be responsible for the day-to-day -day operation and administration of this plan. Nine times out of 10, in all the documents we've seen, taken over, worked with, the plan document refers back to the employer as being the administrator of the plan. So in many cases, the company owner, partner, shareholders are both the employer of the plan and they're the plan administrator. Um, as I've indicated in the far right box, 
This is where a company might hire a third party administrator, such as CRI TPA services, to help them with that role. But that is a fiduciary role of the plan administrator. You could be listed as a trustee. The third tier as a trustee is where you are responsible for the assets of the plan. And so if you are um, picking the investment manager, you are deciding which funds to have in your plan, and you're managing the transactions in the plan, in that trust, as a trustee, as a designated named trustee, that's a fiduciary. Now, what you can do if you're the trustee is you could hire an investment manager who is specifically going to serve with you as a co-fiduciary and an investment manager will simply be in charge of the funds in the plan. They will pick the investments. They will decide um, when to pull funds. They'll monitor funds. If a fund is not performing, they may say, we're going to pull it and replace it. Um, but the but this investment manager is typically hired by the employer or the trustee. Sometimes those are the same person, um, but to help them manage the funds. And so those are the three, what we call, des I mean, four designated fiduciaries that most plans have in their written documentation. If you're not listed as a trustee in one of these, I mean, as a fiduciary in one of these four roles, that's where you could potentially still be a fiduciary. Under the previous slide, we talked about the functional fiduciary. And so um, a lot of times it's the same person. I have, we have plenty of plans where the owner of the company is a fiduciary, both as the employer they're the plan administrator and they're the trustee and they manage their own investments. And so that person who is filling all these roles has a tremendous amount of fiduciary liability for the plan because you're serving all, all of those roles. And before I go to the next slide, Joy, we did have one question. Okay. I'll ask it here, I'll, I'll just throw it out here. Um, the question, this was actually a couple slides back talking about who is a fiduciary. Um, and the question was, so does investment advice for a fee include fees charged by an advisor to individual 401k participants as a percentage of fine assets? I, I would say if you are rendering investment advice to that participant, yes, you would be considered a, a fiduciary. Would and, you agree, Dan? I agree. And so in the investment world, and I don't know, I don't think we have a, a space on this, you know, you might see different levels of service provided by the advisor. Some advisors are purely engaged to provide employee education and assistance and guidance. Um, but then they may be using a, a, an automated ad, uh, adv investment advisor, like a what's called a Wilshire, a 321 or 338 advisor, like a Wilshire or Iron Financial, those types of groups. You, in those cases, that advisor who's getting paid a fee out of plan assets would argue they're only providing employee education and talking about the plan, they're not providing advice. They would argue even though they're getting paid out of the plan, they're not a fiduciary. Um, the levels up above that, the next two would be a, a three, what's called a 321, you might've heard that term. 321 investment advisor, those are going to be a, a co-fiduciary with you uh, as the, the trustee of the plan. And they're, you know, so for example, providing re reports and uh, about the fund investment lineup and the options that are available to participants. And they may say, this fund needs to be changed where, you know, we recommend replacing with this. However, the, the investment committee or the plan administrator trustee would have the ability to override the, and make that decision with, with that investment advisor. And then the third tier of investment advisor you might see investment manager would be where they take all the, they take their responsibility upon themselves and say, XYZ fund has underperformed. We need to, we're going to replace it with ABC fund and, and do that for you. But in general, the investment advisor, especially if they're, giving advice and where to invest money or assisting and, and doing those types of things in general, 
yes, they're, they're going to be a, um, a fiduciary uh, with regards to the plan. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, there will always be at least one fiduciary, but there could be, there could be more fiduciaries, several fiduciaries on a plan. Um, most people think of it from a corporate for-profit business perspective, where if you've got a 401k or a profit sharing money purchase plan, some, some companies have defined benefit pension plans, um, but even simple IRAs, step IRAs and solo Ks, um, technically they've got an employer that's sponsoring the plan, which is a fiduciary. Um, and they've got a plan administrator. And so um, those also have fiduciaries. But other entities that have a fiduciary role for their retirement plan include governmental agencies, state, city, county. And sometimes you don't think about those entities as having any fiduciaries um, because it's very straightforward. But I, I still feel like um, those entities need to follow the same best practices we're going to follow in terms of making sure that their employees' money is protected and they're following certain guidelines. Nonprofit organizations um, would generally have a board, <clears throat> pardon me, or executive directors or a controller. A lot of times nonprofits um, have a small group of people involved, um, but but they still need to act with their fiduciary best practices in mind. Churches, um, this would include elders or ministers, um, colleges, universities, and, and unions, of course, collectively, collectively bargain groups um, are generally on top of who's a fiduciary over those, uh, over those pension plans. And so all kinds of organizations are subject to these um, concepts and these best practices for those who are in a, in a role with discretion over the money. Um, that's the key thing. And then the second aspect here about governance is going to be that th these, these plans, retirement plans in general, are, are regulated, heavily regulated, by both the Department of Labor and the IRS. Um, but they have different perspectives. So under the DOL, you have this very broad piece of um, an act that we call the ERISA, E-R-I-S-A, which is Employee Retirement Income Security Act. It's very old. It was established in 1974. It's still um, governing these plans today. Um, but it has broad and overreaching oversight over health and welfare benefit plans and qualified retirement plans. So under ERISA, the DOL and the Employee Benefit Security Group are focused on ensuring the participants in these plans are treated fairly and that their retirement funds are secure and protected from high fees, from mismanagement. So the, the DOL really um, has a different focus than the IRS. The IRS is, is concerned about what fiduciaries do um, probably from their perspective, more from a, um, a tax revenue perspective, because these plans are um, have tax favored status. There's a lot of deferral of income that runs through these plans. And so the revenue service is also concerned about making sure the fiduciaries um, who have management over all these assets are protecting the participants and acting in the participants' best interest um, so that their funds are there and that the income tax status of the plan doesn't get jeopardized. Um, and so these two agencies will from time to time audit plans. And so our encouragement to you is if you or your clients get an IRS or a DOL audit notice of the retirement plan, you want to first be sure and read it and note the date you have to respond. Don't ignore it. Don't pass it off. You need to respond, but you would also um, be, be advised to get counsel from your TPA, from your advisor. Everyone who's servicing your plan can help uh, respond to those. And so if you get an audit request, you need to 
jump on that. And we, we see some who say, well, I got this a, a couple of, couple of three weeks ago and, you know, I have to respond by tomorrow. And it takes time to gather up all the information they're going to want to see. And so act on those as soon as you get them and don't let them get stale dated and, and passed around from, for somebody to deal with. Just get, get your team involved and help you with it. I'm going to turn this next section over to Dan. He's going to talk about the role of a fiduciary and some of the key components um, of governance and, and concepts. Thank you very much. Um, so what is the role of a fiduciary? I, I like this whole topic of, of, of what a fiduciary is and what roles you have. Um, a lot of it is kind of like ethics, right? You, it, it's common sense. It, it makes sense to do the act in the best interest of everyone else, of the participants of the plan. Um, you know, you know kind of like treat others how you want to be treated, same, same kind of concept here. So follow what was called the prudent man rule. And we'll have a slide on that coming up here. Acting in the best interest of the plan participants. So whether I'm the plan sponsor, okay, whether I'm the plan administrator and plan sponsor, I'm also referring to as employer, whether I'm the trustee or whether I'm the investment advisor, the best interest of the participants, not myself, protect the retirement funds of the participants. Now, what this does not mean is protect it from loss uh, like in the market, right? Most, most plans that we have are participant directed. So they have index funds and actively managed funds. And if the market goes down, then more, more than likely the participants' accounts are going down. That's not what we're referring to here. What we're referring to is uh, the safety of the funds and making sure that the fund lineup from an investment standpoint, or maybe the investment options if it's trustee directed, are avoiding unreasonable or uh, you know, excess losses, right? If the market goes down 35%, like it did drop last year after, when COVID first hit, well, make sure you're not going down 80%, right? Or, or <laughs> a lot more. So protect the retirement funds of those participants. Um, monitor fees that are being charged. So Joy's got some slides later that she'll cover, but there are a lot of different service providers. Again, you can hire out a lot of these functions. You can have, you can hire a TPA. That's our, that's what we do. You can hire an investment advisor. Um, you know, there are plenty of out there that are going to help educate your participants and work with you to, on the investments of the plan. You can hire a trustee, um, a directed trustee, you know, so you can have each of these different service providers. Um, you have a custodian of the assets. Someone's going to hold the money. You have a record keeper to do all the trades and transactions. So we're layering, lay, you layer on a lot of different um, service providers, which that, we all want to get paid. Now, the key thing in that fees, and I'm sure Joy will mention it later, is we're not talking about, it's not a case of the cheapest is always the best, right? Um, there, there's a difference in what the different service providers may provide to you. And so it doesn't mean go with the cheapest. Sometimes the cheapest isn't the right answer. Um, there may be services, but you need to evaluate, okay, if this XYZ provider is going to charge me 1% and ABC is going to charge me 1.25 for that extra cost. What am I going to get out of that? Maybe I'm getting some extra services and for those extra services are the fees being reasonable. Um, and Joy touched on this earlier, monitor the service providers. So make sure the investment advisors are doing what they're supposed to do. Is the TPA providing me the 5,500 to file each year? Is the actuary providing me actuary evaluations each year? Um, is the record keeper sending out participant statements? So you're supposed to, you don't need to know what they do. Maybe you don't have to get into the weeds, but know, are they doing what I'm paying them to do? The last one, or the last two, employee salary deferrals deposit each pay period. That is a big focus of the IRS and DOL when they audit plans. That's a bit, if you're a large plan, that gets audited by a CPA firm, which our firm does that. Um, that's a big focus of those, in, of those auditors as well. Um, and then lastly, making sure the plan is compliant with all regulatory agencies. Uh, so IRS, Department of Labor, 
for pension plans, PBGC. So you've got a lot of different regulatory bodies overseeing this retirement plan. Hey, Dan. Yes. We had a question come in, and I, I feel like it's relevant, so see if we can speak to it. Uh, the comment is, in today's extended pandemic, it's impacting companies and sponsors. Can we give advice on how to balance fiduciary responsibility with a struggling company? Decisions may not appear to be in the participant's best interest, um, but it's a balance. And how do you balance, if you're a fiduciary, how do you balance what's good for the company versus in the best interest of the participants? Um, and I, I think that is probably one of the most valid comments we run into is you've got an employer who's trying to keep the business afloat, but he's got this retirement plan that has all these, let's say, fees and contribution requirements, you know, which, which comes first. And um, I, I think this is a situation where you, if it's required, if it's a required, let's say a required contribution, let's say it's a safe harbor match, you've got to fund it. I would say you need to talk to your advisor, your advisors, your TPA, and say, you know, make sure you know what is what is required because you don't want to jeopardize the tax deferred status of the plan if the company can't make the contributions um, and come up with a plan there. But I can tell you the service would tell you to do what's in the best interest of the participants every time. Um, but for example, I'll just give you a good example. I have a, a company who contacted me. And said, look, we can't, we don't have enough money to pay the employee deferrals, right? So they were withholding money from the employees' checks, but they said they couldn't afford to, you know, they were just struggling. And my comment to that, that client was that that is the employees' contributions that came out of their paychecks. You have to fund it to the plan. You cannot use those employees' deferrals for the light bill. Right. If anything, maybe you tell the employees you need to suspend the contributions, but those salary deferrals were essentially wages you would have had to pay to them if, if they didn't have the plan. And so if money is considered a part of the plan assets and belongs to the participants, um, it's got to take a priority, in my opinion. But you can always amend your plan, change things. Um, so that you mitigate your future liabilities, but you you it, it is a fine line for sure, and I think it's exacerbated by this pandemic. And and to add to that, um, you know, you you just say how do you balance the responsibility for a struggling company having a having a retirement plan with a certain level of match or that kind of thing? To me, that's not a um, and. I may, I may not express this correctly, but that is not a fiduciary capacity, right? The, the having a retirement plan with a company match, the match is 6% or 3% or whatever that match is. So you can change or stop that. And if you need to stop that, again, you can talk to your TPA, there may be consequences of that. Um, that making, you know, stopping contributions or company contributions, to me, that isn't a, again, that's a business decision, but that's not a fiduciary decision there or an issue uh, that's, are you acting in the best interest? That's not what we're talking about here, but from a, you know, the offerings of the plan or the, again, as Joy mentioned, funding employee contributions, that has to keep on happening. You, even if you're struggling, you would have paid employees. If they didn't defer, they, you would have paid them money. Um, regardless, one way or the other. So you need to remit employee contributions or employee loan payments. Uh, you, unfortunately, you do need to continue to monitor the retirement plan. Um, doesn't mean you have to do it every day, every month, um, but you, you do need to continue to, to monitor the plan. Maybe do it once a year, maybe every once every couple of years. Uh, you still have those duties, whether the business is good or bad. Um, so again, it goes goes back. What's the role of a fiduciary? Talking about the prudent man rule. So it, it essentially, in in how would someone, a, a prudent person, act in given the the circumstances, the facts and circumstances? So you're required to act responsibly with with the funds entrusted to you. 
no matter what your role in the plan is. So regarding the investment selections, again, you can hire this stuff out. You can have advisors helping you. There's nothing saying you can't do that, but um, you need to look at all the facts and, and the, the information. Use diversified investments, right? You, we don't want to just set up a retirement plan and give the participants one investment option. You got to have different options for them to choose from. The big ones really to me, and, and again, this is the common sense stuff, but it's avoiding common co avoiding conflicts of interest. Um, uh, and again, this doesn't usually have this doesn't happen with larger plans, um, but maybe we've got a solo owner only plan, right? And this is a common thing or self-directed IRA. You might see this. Um, I, Hey, yeah, I've got this money in my 401k. I want to buy a beach house over, over at the beach. Um, and yeah, I'm going to use it every couple of months. Well, you can't do that. That's a conflict of interest. Yeah. It, you know, so you've, yeah, it's my money. It's in my 401k. However, these rules apply to large plans and they apply to owner only retirement plans. So avoiding self-dealing or dealing with parties of interest. I can't sell things. So if I've got a piece of land in my retirement plan, I can't sell that to my spouse and then buy, you know, have it, use it personally. I can't sell it to my brother um, or my parents. So again, avoid self-dealing, even though it may be a, a proper transaction, which you get for fair market value, you have to avoid those things. Those are prohibited transactions. And then lastly, monitor and oversee the paid service providers, making sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Again, claiming that you have no knowledge or expertise in this is, you know, claiming ignorance is not a good defense. Um, you do have that responsibility. So you have to act and make decisions that a person of a, in the similar capacity would make. Again, hire those that can help you and make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. But you can't claim, I don't know what I'm doing. And therefore, I'm completely protected. That, that doesn't fly. Um, all right, let me get to the next slide. Sorry. There we go. So again, acting in the best interest of participants. Sometimes as a fiduciary, especially in smaller plans, the smaller plan you are, the more hats you're going to wear. Uh, Joy mentioned, I might be the business owner, the plan administrator, the trustee, and the investment manager. I might have multiple hats. So the the fiduciary has to make decisions in the best interest of the plan and the plan participants, even if those decisions are not always good for the company itself. <clears throat> Our plan made a mistake. We forgot to put in um, uh, the company, cal we calculated the employee match wrong. Now we got to put in an extra $20,000. Well, that just because that's $20,000 is going to cost the company doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Right, the error was made. The IRS has guidance of how to correct errors. Here's what we need to do we need to fix it. So, you have to balance that, right? The failure to correct errors for the participants, it's an increased cost to the company. Selection of service providers, you know, hey, my cousin is an investment advisor. I want to use them, them to manage my retirement plan, but they're twice as expensive as anybody else. Well, if it wasn't your cousin, would you go with that person? You know, so again, you have to, again, it's tough, right? But you have to make, do what's in the best interest of the plan and the participants, not yourself. A good example that, that Joy has here was, um, you know, a kind of a, a quid pro quo situation where plan is at XYZ record keeper. <clears throat> their, their commercial lender says, hey, if you move your plan to us, we're going to drop the interest rate on your loan by a quarter of a percent or half a percent. Is that benefiting my participants or is it benefiting, benefiting the fiduciary, the business owner who's going to make that decision, right? Um, you know, if the IRS and Department of Labor came in and looked at that, would they say that's a breach of fiduciary duty? Again, you'd probably have to look at all the situation here, but potentially um, they could, they, they may. So I think that's a very fine line right there. I'm not saying they're right or wrong one way or the other, but you gotta be careful in a situation like that where maybe you're being enticed with other savings or maybe I have my personal investments, I'm gonna get a fee reduction on my personal investments if I bring the whole plan over. Again, how's that one, how's that gonna get caught? It's a fine line, it's, it's tough. Um, 
So some prime considerations, and, and this is going to be a recurring theme on a lot of these, keep records of decisions that are made and implementation of those. Keeping records. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about that quite a bit. Um, you know, I'm going to skip the bounce around here because you guys will get the slides. I think they'll be emailed out here the next day or so. Um, but conduct regular review meetings with your service providers and keep meeting notes and document a list of vendors and the fee disclosures that are provided and document that we reviewed it. Documentation is a good thing. Um, if you have those, if, if you ever, worst case scenario, you get some participant that sues the company for, for mismanagement of the plan, or you have the Department of Labor IRS come in and ask questions and say, hey, what did you do for this? If you've got those records and documents, you know, hey, maybe it didn't turn out the right way, but if you could say, hey, at this time, we made the best decision we could, that's gonna go a long way should, again, the worst case scenario happen. Um, for, from a liability standpoint, um, there's two things you may see, right? The first one that all plans have to have is a fidelity bond. That is a requirement of the plan. It gets reported on the 5,500, whether or not you have one. It protects the plan in the case of a theft. So my, my bookkeeper, instead of remitting the 401k deferrals to the plan, they send them straight to their bank account, right? They, took, they stole from the plan. The plans do the money. So the bond protects the plan up to, again, 10% of the plan assets up to $500,000. All plans should have that. They're pretty inexpensive. What's optional is a fiduciary liability insurance. You may see this more and more. Uh, for those of you going to apply for this insurance or for your fidelity bond, you may see this added on. It's a little bit more costly, but it protects the fiduciary in case of a lawsuit or due to errors, um, maybe legal costs. This is a little bit more costly. Would I do it if, and so it's going to depend on maybe plan size, company size, you know, and, and that sort of thing. So that's a company by company, plan by plan decision. If I was a startup plan with no assets and five employees, would I put have fiduciary liability insurance? Probably not. If I've got 150 employees and a $15 million plan, I'm probably going to lean towards, yeah, or I'd have a, a directed trustee company. Uh, or, you know, I would try to mitigate those those potential losses if I could. Now turning over to Joy for some best practice, starting our best practices for fiduciaries. All right, we're going to spend the, the last part of our session today talking about some best practices. Um, again, th this is a list that we've kind of already covered, um, but, you know, if I were to come to your office and say, show me your fiduciary compliance folder. What, what do you got in it? How many, how many of you could say you have a fiduciary folder, a file that keeps anything in it? Um, this is something you should start. Just, just start it and start putting things in it. You want to also consider, especially if you're a larger plan, like Dan said, sometimes if you're a smaller plan, maybe not. But if you're a large plan, establish a committee and meet regularly that will review things, that will monitor the service providers, that will talk about what's going on um, on the financials of the plan. Um, having a plan committee and meet regularly is a good best practice. Um, keep, as we talked about, keep notes. I cannot tell you how many times the conversation is, well, we met, but I don't remember exactly who, who was responsible for following up on this or that. So put someone in charge of keeping meeting notes of every meeting that's had and documenting things. Um, maintain a current list of your service providers and their fees. Again, we come across clients all the time who say, I, I have no idea how much so-and-so is getting paid. I have no idea how much the investments cost my participants. Keep a list. This is a fiduciary obligation to know what your participants are being charged and by whom and what are the services. So keep a list of service providers. Keep a list of the named fiduciaries. We went back to that slide that had the four primary, the employer, the plan administrator, the trustee, and the investment manager. 
have a list and, and have it readily available. Keep copies of reports. Um, your TPA and your investment folks probably send you a lot of paperwork at the end of the year. It's important that you keep those. And um, I would say more importantly than keeping them, take it to your plan committee and review them. Look at them. See what they say. You'd be surprised what you can find if you start actually opening the reports and looking at the detail that's in them. Um, every three years, you should benchmark what we call benchmark your fees. So put the plan out to bid and see if you can um, show that your plan fees are still reasonable given the current market um, and the services being provided. Again, you're, as Dan said, you're not obligated to have the lowest cost fee every time. It's got to be a reasonable fee for the service you're given. And so periodically, um, every three years, sometimes three to five, put the plan out to bid and see if your fees are still reasonable. Um, another big compliance, deposit the employee deferrals timely. This is a very common, um, I, it's an error. The IRS considers it an error. We'll talk about it, but deposit the employee's monies as soon as possible. Keep the plan documents up to date. And if you have an error or if you make a mistake, the IRS has a lot of correction programs that they'll tell you if you correct it this way, it's, you're good. So into more detail, service providers. You've got an investment broker, a TPA, a trustee. You might have a directed corporate trustee, an auditor. If you've got a DB plan, you've got an actuary. You need to keep a list of which service providers are on your plan and then what they charge. What are their fees? Fees are often broken down. I've got it here four ways. An asset-based fee, where it's a percentage of each person's account balance. It might be a flat fee, where it's a specific dollar amount per person. So they might be paying $50 per person out of their account. Um, it can be blended, a little bit of both, so a percentage and a flat fee per year. And then the fees could be billed directly to the company. And so the company might be paying for, for some plan expenses as ordinary business expenses and taking a deduction for it. So it's important that you understand how the fees are being charged and who's paying them. Um, on the next slide, I think this is just an example of your list. You should have a, a list that says, here's my service providers, and then here's what they're charging me on an annual basis, either as a percentage or a dollar amount. And then is it paid out of plan, the plan, out of the investments, or is the company paying for it? This is what you would want in that compliance folder, a list of the service providers, the names, and what they're charging you. The other thing we talk about in the annual review, a client sometimes say, well, what would we talk about? And so um, my question sometimes is there's a thousand things you could talk about, but here's, here's a recommended agenda. If you wanted to start holding review meetings, you could start with these agendas. Have you had any amendments or changes? Did you look at the IRS compliance testing in the year-end reports? Look at the investment earnings and the performance of the funds. A lot of times I have clients who cannot tell me if their plan's making 2% interest on their earnings or 15. They just don't know because they don't look at it. So that's part of what you could do during this meeting. Uh, you could discuss the plan's tax return that was filed. Um, make sure the ERISA bond is up to date. And just talk generally about enrollments and how are the employees... Um, how are the employees reacting to plan changes? So there's a lot you could, you could do in a review meeting. I would have as many people on that list attend as possible. Anybody who's associated with the plan, um, the investment manager, the TPA, the trustees, everybody could attend a, a meeting and then give their input. And again, keep notes. Every meeting you have about the plan, keep notes, keep a permanent record. Who was there, what date, what dis was discussed, and what action items come out of that meeting. 
continuing on and in the best practices, employee contributions, as, as I mentioned, if you've ever had an IRS or Department of Labor audit, this is, this is like the, one of the favorite things that they want to look at is, is are you depositing um, employee money? Again, I, I get paid $1,000 and I'm contributing $100 out of my check into the plan. Are you remitting that timely to the plan? Or are you sitting on it and doing it three months later, a month later, a year later, <laughs> or not at all? Um, so general rule, right? Employee deferrals, again, what's coming in loan payments, okay? Must be deposited to the plant as soon, so segregated from employer assets as soon as possible after the check date. So I get check date on Friday, that's gotta go in with it pretty quickly. Um, so what you'll probably see out there is as soon as administratively feasible or by the no later than the 15th day of the month following the month deferrals are withheld. In today's world with electronic uh, ACHs and online access to everything, that 15th day of the month following, it, you're, it's very, very difficult to say that's reasonable anymore. Um, so if you are late, <clears throat> You can be subject to penalties, um, lost interest, lost earnings on that money, right? That money could have been in, invested in earning some money for the employee. So you have to, you may have to make that, those earnings up and pay an excise tax uh, to the IRS for being late. So what is considered timely? So for small plans, it's actually pretty easy. The Department of Labor about 10 years ago came out with the small plan safe harbor, under 100 employees, non-audited plans. You have seven business days after the check date, the pay date, okay? Not when you run payroll, but the actual check date when it was actually money changed hands to the employee. So if I get paid on Friday, I got seven business days, that's about 10 calendar days. That's a lot of time to go on, go online to the record keeper's website and either upload a file or key in the information. Um, I strongly recommend my clients do it as part of their payroll procedures. They run payroll, go ahead and, and do the deferrals at the same time. Um, so that's for small plans. Large plans is a different story. Um, uh, again, your, your auditor may have some different guidance on this. In general, this is just a general rule of thumb. In general, if you're within three business days, you're, you're probably pretty good. But um, you know, you may have some auditors that say, "Okay, you're you're five days consistently, you're 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 good to go." You may have some that say, "Hey, you you were always doing this the day of payroll, but you had these five or six that were maybe ten days late." So those those are are late. Um, so again, general rule: the faster you can do it, the better. Um, again. In today's world, it's employee money. And the reason this is so important is because the IRS and Department of Labor view this as if you don't remit employee money, you're borrowing money from the plan, which is a prohibited transaction. So that's, that's the whole reason why this is such a big focus um, of the IRS and DOL. Correcting plan errors. Um, this is one area, again, the IRS gets a, a bad reputation, right? Just it's the IRS, they're, they're mean, they're scary. Um, in the retirement plan world, I, I personally believe they do a great job of recognizing people make mistakes and giving plan sponsors and practitioners a way to fix those mistakes. Um, so errors happen in every single plan. I could probably pick up every single plan that's out there and find at least one error that's happening. Even the best run plans are going to have a mistake from time to time. Is it the end of the world? No. You, there Again, the IRS has certain procedures. In general, most errors, the most common is going to be some kind of operational error. For example, um, the company the we forgot on this individual to, they, they elected 10, they changed their deferral election from 5% to 10%, and we forgot to adjust the payroll system, so we only withheld 5%. How do we fix that? So again, is it a big deal? No, it's not the end of the world. We can fix it, but um, you know, our, it's our responsibility to, to get those things fixed and clean things up. 
So the IRS has what they call EPCRS, E-P-C-R-S, Employee Plans Compliance Resolution System. And within that, they've got really two general programs that you can use if you're not under audit. The self-correction program, you get to fix it regardless of, uh, without any IRS approval, or their voluntary correction program where you submit it to the IRS and they give you their blessing. That costs some money, of course, for preparation if we were to prepare it as well as the IRS charges a fee. And the worst case scenario, they catch something if they audit your plan. Um, so irs.gov, if you just Google correcting IRS and correcting plan errors, they have a whole bunch of scenarios and how to fix them with details of here's what you do and examples. It's, it is actually very, they do a very good job. Department of Labor also has some fix it for from a fiduciary standpoint. If I have an impermissible loan or I have some self-dealing, I can correct it with the Department of Labor. Again, is it free? Is, are these things going to be free and not cost me any money? Probably not. However, again, we're, the whole name of the game is doing what's in the best interest of the plan and the plan participants. I should, again, follow those these correction procedures to the best of my ability. Um, so uh, one question that came in, Differences between a, and going back to the deferrals, differences between a small plan and a large plan for deposit timing. So a small plan, very, that's a very good question. Um, a small plan is a plan that's not audited, okay, when we use that, that term. So in general, under 100 participants. Once you hit that 100 participant threshold, it may be 120 the first year, but 100, 100, 120 participant threshold and have to get audited by an outside CPA firm each year with an independent CPA report, then those plans are gonna be held to the higher standard that you need to get your deferrals in as soon as possible. So that's the differentiator there is, is not, it's, it's gonna be based on plan participants, not plan asset size, but participant count. Um, so again, in review, summary, may, you know, document what you have. Maintain a list of the fiduciaries of the plan, the service providers, the fees that are paid to those service providers. Um, conduct annual meetings. Um, can, uh, hold annual meetings. Document those meetings in writing. Uh, correct plan errors as soon as possible. Again, maybe I don't catch it for a couple months, but correct it once I find out about it. Maintain a file. And, and this is not a DIY project, so seek out service providers. We, we are a TPA, we can help. We can help answer those questions or assist with best practices. We have an investment advisor on level four. They can do investment work. We have a, you know, again, this is the plug session, right? We have a trustee, uh, a company, a trust company, preferred legacy trust. Whoever your service providers are, Seek out those service providers and experts in the field to help run your plan um, in, as, as best as possible. Um, thank you very much for, for joining. We've tried to answer the questions as they, they've come up. Um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out. You should be getting within the next 24 hours or so um, an email as a follow-up with uh, the slides for today. Um, we do thank you for, for taking time out of your day. If you've got follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to me or Joy, um, and we will be happy to, to answer your question and, and help you out there. And with that, thank you and have a good day. Bye, everyone.